I also want to thank and congratulate Dean Jennifer Martinez, the first Latina Dean in Stanford Law School's history. I know that last year the law school also hired its first Native American Indigenous faculty member, who I'm proud to say was a lawyer at the Legal Defense Fund before joining the Academy, Professor Elizabeth Reese. These strides to bring more diversity to the Stanford community, however long overdue, should be great sources of pride for the students, faculty, administrators, and alumni of the law school. I am so grateful that David invited me and the students of the Law Review invited me to participate in this timely forum by the Stanford Law Review and the Stanford Law School, along with so many excellent speakers and scholars, uh, many of whom I know personally and professionally, including former United States Attorney General Eric Holder, who was also a former board of LDF, a uh, board member of, of the Legal Defense Fund and a former LDF intern, which is a little known fact, uh, and the esteemed election law scholar and lawyer and my former faculty colleague at NYU Law, Bob Bauer, and so many others. I could probably spend the remainder of this address uh, thanking and greeting all the wonderful folks I know who are participating. But let me say good afternoon to you all and I hope this is a wonderful start to what I know will be a rich and engaging symposium. I wish I could be there with you in person. Instead, uh, thanks to our expanded embrace of technology in the pandemic, I can at least appear before you virtually from the land of the Lenape people in New York. Before I begin, uh, let me express the fact that I'm not only honored to deliver this keynote address, but I am so very pleased that I'm about to begin a conversation with you about how we can safeguard the fundamental right to vote. And Dean Martinez said it best that the right to vote is preservative of all rights. In fact, that's what the Supreme Court said back in 1886 in a case called Yikuo versus Hopkins. The right to vote is preservative of all other rights. And because of that, it is in dire need of our protection. The Senate's failure last month to pass legislation to restore the Voting Rights Act was proof, as if any more was needed, that we are at a crossroads concerning the future of our constitutional democracy. And it is a moment that calls to question whether the abundant promise of our multiracial, multi-ethnic democracy will ever come to pass. Across the country, from state houses in Georgia and Texas to the school board meetings in Florida and Virginia, a multi-pronged campaign against our fledgling democracy is advancing and the forces behind it continue to grow more brazen. Presently, this backlash of retrenchment and reaction can be broken down into three main parts that I've come to refer to as the trifecta of assaults on our democracy. And before I explain this trifecta in greater detail, I'm compelled to note two critical predicates. One, the attack on our democracy has become more radical since the 2020 presidential election, which featured unprecedented multiracial and multi-ethnic organizing and voter mobilization campaigns, as well as historic levels of turnout from Black, Brown, and Asian voters. Two, the most obvious manifestation of this increasingly radical assault on our democracy, namely the violent insurrection of the U on the US Capitol on January 6th of last year. You may recall that happened the day after there was a runoff contest in Georgia that resulted in the election of the state's first black and first Jewish senator respectively. Now I would argue that the sequence of these events in both cases is not coincidental and it's telling. The growing assertion of political power among people of color continues to engender backlash, retribution, and yes, violence, as it has predictably and disappointingly throughout this country's history. Even when those reactionary forces threaten the very existence of democracy itself as they do now. And what has engendered an even more frightening strain of nihilism to preserve a 
crumbling foundation of white supremacy is that the political power of people of color is not only growing, but it is both unifying and diversifying to include persons committed to issues like climate justice, healthcare, gender inclusivity, reproductive rights, economic security, and other matters of human concern, regardless of race. So that's the backdrop. And for many, that's the threat. And what has been the response? What is this trifecta of assaults that I referred to a few moments ago? It is what I believe is the most comprehensive, multi-layered, multi-directional threat to the right to vote that we have seen to date. And I'll, I'll let that sit with you for a moment because if we know anything about this country's extensive, sordid history of racial, gender, and wealth discrimination in voting, that's saying a lot. The first assault, in this trifecta is the most obvious and direct. It is focused squarely on our electoral system itself. It is manifest in the fact that 27 states have introduced pre-filed or carried over 250 bills with restrictive voting provisions in this year alone. And this is according to a report released by the Brennan Center for Justice just this week. That is roughly three and a half times the number of restrictive voting bills last year. These laws include provisions that ban mobile voting, that narrow the identification requirements for requesting and casting an absentee ballot, that compress the time period for, for uh, requesting the absentee ballot, that restrict the number and location of secure drop boxes, if not ban them outright that disqualify out of precinct provisional ballots, laws that drastically reduce early voting and that most notoriously ban the provision of basic sustenance of water and snacks to voters who are waiting in line to vote. Not surprisingly, a disproportionate number of whom are black and Latino who wait on average 45% longer to vote than white voters and like North Carolina's voter ID law that was struck down by the Fourth Circuit in 2016 on the ground that it aimed to disenfranchise Black communities with, quote, almost surgical precision. Many of the laws passing and being debated in state legislatures across the country do just the same. And if directly threatening the ability to cast a ballot weren't enough, Many of these laws also include invitations to subvert election results altogether by placing apolitical election administrators with partisan extremists who promise to throw out votes in future elections for the sake of advancing the big lie and the maintenance of a political system of white economically elite dominance. That's just the first assault. The second part of this trifecta concerns restricting the right to assembly and protest, which is connected to the right to vote. It's so un-American and, and yet not. The historic and multiracial protests demanding police accountability that spread throughout this country in response to the murder of George Floyd demonstrated the potentially transformative power of diverse masses of people coming together for a common cause. Indeed, the protests of 2020 brought people of various backgrounds, races and ethnicities, ages and socioeconomic statuses all together around a single set of issues to demand a reexamination of one of the oldest systems of power in our country, law enforcement. We swiftly saw states begin to enact legislation that not only limited avenues of peaceful protests like HB1 in Florida that LDF and its partners have since preliminarily enjoined, but that invited violence against protesters, those engaging in true, peaceful, First Amendment protected, legitimate political discourse. By limiting protest, dissent is silenced, not only in the ballot box, but also in the streets and corridors of America's cities, towns, and states. Finally, the third component of this tripartite assault on our democracy 
is about creating a climate of self-censorship and fear through the banning of truth. All of the assaults, of all of the assaults, this one holds the most potential to lead to our undoing and arguably does the most to undermine the efficacy of the vote. The proliferation of book bans and the imposition of gag orders in taxpayer funded school systems and institutions of higher learning across the country will without question produce generations of persons so ignorant of history, so devoid of critical thinking skills, so indoctrinated by omission that the urgency of the first two strategies will give way to the mind control cemented by the third. Eventually, the right to vote will be diminished, not by voter suppression laws or restrictions on protest, but by the lack of will and capacity of those with access to the vote. Now, a year ago, this diagnosis may have sounded like hyperbole and hysteria, and to some it may still, but when books that use personification to tell the story of the Holocaust or narrate the life of a fictive black girl whose brown eyes render her blind to her own beauty or tell the, stump, the coming of age story of a Native American teen, when those books are banned or when the first instinct of a well-endowed private university is to elect to abandon DEI commitments and deny the existence of structural racism in the face of a challenge instead of defending them, there is cause for alarm because democracy is nothing if not the exercise of the free thought of the polity. And as the incoming president and director counsel of this country's most storied civil rights organization, founded as Professor Mills said in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall and over 80 years later, still fighting for the rights and the full recognition of the dignity and humanity of black people in America and for our democracy. I've had to think about what it will take to pull this country from the edge of the cliff on which our democracy seems to be dangling. I've had to think about what it means to safeguard the right to vote in the fullest sense. Fortunately, we have an amazing team at the Legal Defense Fund, so I don't have to try to solve these conundrums alone. And we are also fortunate to be part of a larger ecosystem of racial and social justice advocacy organizations with whom we work collaboratively and strategically. And through our organizing, advocacy, legislation, public education, research, and of course, litigation, we are responding to this trifecta with a full array of tools and tactics to defend the heart and soul of our democracy, which is the right to vote. In the years leading up to the 2020 elections, we at LDF, like many other pro-democracy organizations, knew we were facing an unprecedented and daunting challenge. So early on, I worked with a group of academics, uh, practitioners, thought leaders, and other influential and informed voices, including several who are part of this symposium, as part of an emergency committee to advise media companies, tech corporations, law firms, and, and political figures of all stripes on how best to ensure the 2020 elections were free, fair, and democratic. At some time, people considered our warnings excessive. From today's vantage point, however, it's clear that our fears were more prescient than we knew. What's most important though, is that we assume the next presidential election will occur in circumstances no less difficult and that we must apply whatever lessons we've drawn from our 2020 successes as we plan to safeguard the right to vote in 2022, 2024 and beyond. We now have that muscle and that imagination of worst case scenarios to inform our strategies. So for example, as many of you are aware, just this week, the Supreme Court granted a stay to allow a racially discriminatory redistricting map in Alabama to govern the upcoming 2022 primary and general congressional elections. 
as we argued in our suit on behalf of Black Alabama voters and organizations, because the state's redistricting plan packs its 27% Black population into a single district, ensuring that in only one out of Alabama's seven congressional districts do Black voters have an equal opportunity to elect a candidate of their choice, that map runs afoul of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. And Section 2 bans any voting system that results in a denial or abridgment of the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race. Each and every Black voter in Alabama who is subject to the discriminatory map that the Supreme Court has allowed to go forward has their right to vote abridged and denied as a result of that decision. Both the map and the Supreme Court's provisional ruling were grave, grave disappointments, but in reality, they were not a surprise. For years, we at LDF have known that the 2021 redistricting cycle would be the first in generations to be undertaken without the necessary protection of yet another provision of the Voting Rights Act, Section 5. In 2013, in a case called Shelby County versus Holder, yes, that same Holder, the Supreme Court disabled that key provision, which deters and guards against discriminatory redistricting and would have prevented the map in Alabama from moving forward. And we knew that some state legislators across the country would be all too eager to see how far they could go in this new normal without Section 5. So knowing this, we launched an initiative that we called Power on the Lines, Making Redistricting Work for Us, which included a guide for voters to educate themselves about redistricting, not only concerning the basics, but also why voters should participate in the process and how they could do so most effectively. Everyday citizens, including an impressive number of college students showed up en masse to our trainings, to learn the nuts and bolts of redistricting and to create maps that reflect their visions of power and community. Other of our litigation efforts have resulted in significant victories to safeguard the right to vote. We recently settled our claim against the United States Postal Service after we and our partners at Public Citizen sued over the US Postal Service's failure to ensure the timely delivery of mail ballots during the summer of 2020. You may recall that there was a slowdown of ballot delivery by the USPS. The USPS is now required to undertake serious measures to ensure that a similar slowdown in ballot delivery doesn't happen again in future elections. And we know that this will be critical for 2022 and 2024 and the countless local and state elections that occur simultaneously and in between. Similarly, our lawsuit against then President Donald Trump for his dog whistling and unconstitutional attempts to pressure officials in Michigan into outright rejecting all ballots from Detroit helped thwart a seditious campaign to overthrow the 2020 election results. In that suit, we've alleged that the targeting of the majority black city of Detroit was an unequivocal form of racial discrimination and intimidation in violation of the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, not something that you hear about often these days. But the Ku Klux Klan Act, also known as the Third Enforcement Act, made it a federal crime to use force, intimidation, or threat to infringe on the right to vote. So by bringing a lawsuit and forcing that important provision, we are safeguarding the right to vote. But as we saw during the insurrection at the US Capitol, and as we were reminded when the Senate failed to put the Freedom to Vote John R. Lewis Act up for a simple majority vote obstructed by an arcane racist procedural rule called the filibuster, the victories we've notched, while important, have not arrested the general slide away from democracy. Those of us who worked on the ground and used digital campaigns to mobilize voters in a pandemic to yield historic turnout have argued repeatedly 
that the Herculean efforts undertaken in 2020 by black and brown organizers and the resources of pro-democracy and pro-civil rights organizations should not be mistaken as evidence that these interlocking anti-democratic forces can be overcome through relentless organizing and aggressive litigation. They cannot. As, as great as our team is, they cannot do it without federal legislation. And it's unfair and naive to think that they can. It's only through federal legislation that is specifically and responsively crafted to repair the parts of the Voting Rights Act that have been gutted and stripped of all meaning by the Supreme Court in recent years that will suffice. As a letter recently sent to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and signed by LDF along with 52 other organizations notes, voters of color are facing the greatest threat to voting rights since Jim Crow. We need standardized election laws throughout the country. We need national voter ID laws. We need to make election day a federal holiday to make it easier for people to vote. We need provisions like those and others in the John R. Lewis Act, the Freedom to Vote Act, that would extend early voting to 15 days, that would provide for no excuse voting by mail and same day registration and automatic voter registration. We need the provisions in that legislation that will eliminate long lines at polls by limiting wait times to half an hour. We need to deter and punish voter intimidation and deception. We need to do away with outrageous laws that ban giving food and water to voters waiting in line. And we need to restore voting rights to the formerly incarcerated. Those are basic reforms that can expand access to the ballot that can safeguard the right to vote in all of its fullness. But we need more. In the area of redistricting, we need to eliminate political and racial gerrymandering. The devastation of racial gerrymandering is demonstrated by the Alabama case I just described. And we know that the Supreme Court in Rucho versus Common Cause in 2019 said that partisan gerrymandering is non-justiciable, that if there is to be any way to curb it, it must happen through legislation. And that is what the John R. Lewis Act can do. It importantly can also protect local election official, officials from removal for political reasons. It stops voter purges and vote tampering so that there won't be a failure to certify election results. It also provides for election security by requiring paper ballots and transparent election audits. And finally, the bill tackles the issue of dark money in politics. It requires groups to disclose their donors and it halts the funneling of foreign money into US elections. And it establishes a campaign finance system based on small donor matching funds. These are common sense reforms and protections that are being held hostage by institutions in our country that bear the hallmark of historical inequality and a white supremacist ideology. If we do not act, if we do not challenge these threats to the right to vote, they will take root in intractable ways. And it's grim, but as unique as the specifics of our present moment are, we should not forget that we as a country have been here before. Indeed, when LDF was founded in 1940, this country's first attempt at multiracial democracy known as Reconstruction, had already been dead for two generations. Rights ostensibly secured through the tribulations and sacrifices of the Civil War seemed to be, nearly a century later, little more than dead letters. During that moment of history, before the defeat of Nazism, before Brown versus Board of Education, before the Montgomery bus boycott, and before anyone attached any special significance to the initials MLK, few besides the most wild-eyed optimists would have expected the apocal achievements that were soon to come. We must remember that our history is full of examples 
of moments when progress, even piecemeal and modest progress, was met with backlash and retrenchment. We must remind ourselves that history is not linear and that the American experiment has not been one long and interrupted march towards a more perfect union. If there's one signal difference between the time of our movement and make no mistake, we are in a time of movements. It's just a matter of which one you are a part of. But if there's one difference between the movements of today and the past, it's that we at times lack that sense of momentum propelled by action, that inborn confidence that assumes almost unconsciously that tomorrow will be better than today, but only if we do the work. That yes, the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice, but we have to create the gravitational pull. So back then, and despite multiple overlapping legal edifices that were all constructed to justify, normalize, and perpetuate the subjugation of Black and Indigenous people and other people of color, the movement for justice had the advantage of being on the offensive. If you think about some of the cases I mentioned, as powerful as they are, as significant as those interventions were, they did not advance us. They only held ground. Progress before was fitful and its costs were often frightful, but there was a widespread and bedrock assumption that it was a question of not whether, but when, not of if, but how. And indeed that assumption of ultimate progress is embedded in some of the error's most memorable and powerful phrases. The fierce urgency of now, after all, is contrasted with the apathetic complacency of later not the stubborn belligerence of never. Today, we are in a different place. Today, far more often, we are in the awkward position of defending a system that many of us initially got into this work to change, myself included. We must defend the gains we've made with every ounce of strength and conviction that we can muster, even when we know the ground on which we fight has been tilted against us. At the same time, we must also think strategically but boldly about how we can use all of the tools at our disposal from storytelling to advocacy to litigation to plant seeds that will blossom in the future when decisions such as Shelby County and Rucho versus Common Cause and Brnovich versus DNC and now Merrill versus Milligan are rightly seen as the grave errors that they are. While we take solace in decisions like that of the North Carolina Supreme Court's recent invalidation of its state's hyper gerrymandered and undemocratic redistricting map. That is a sign of hope. That is a sign of the possibility of the work that can be done at the state level while we continue to fight for federal legislation. And while we recognize that the number of voter suppression bills may have increased more than threefold in a year, there are at least 32 states that have introduced, pre-filed, or carried over 399 bills that expanded voting access, or would expand if they are, in fact, uh, law. So we must remain nimble and opportunistic to seize the, advanta the advantage for justice, fairness, and democracy for a time when that cycle of progress and retrenchment turns once again for the moment when a new opportunity to better align this country's actions with this professed values arrives once again. To that end, and to close, I'd like to speak directly to those of you who are just beginning your careers in the law during this moment of peril and uncertainty. You know what you are facing, a radical, reactionary movement to return to a fictional golden era in which white Christian male dominance was achieved through a social, political, and economic order that was jerry-rigged to provide a steady advantage based on discrimination. And you know that is not the future you want for your country or your community or yourselves. You know that that is not the only future that is possible for these United States. 
you know that there is a future that includes the rapidly browning electorate that will make this country a vibrant, multiracial, multi-ethnic plurality as early as 2040. A democracy that includes all demographics, including those who presently believe that we cannot all coexist in this paradigm. But the mystery lies not only in the specifics of what an alternative future would look like, but the pathway to achieve it. And that's where you come in. Although it is true that no one generation could or should be asked to solve a problem that is centuries in the making, during unique moments in history such as ours, when it is clear that we are in an existential moment in our evolution as a democracy, you have a special assignment. You have a special assignment to see the full threat and opportunity before us. Because for better or worse, it is your future and that of your progeny that hangs in the balance. We need you to push both yourselves and the rest of us to resist fatalism and despair. We need you to push yourselves and the rest of us to think imaginatively and radically about how we can finally and fully secure the promise of this nation. And in the here and now, that means two things. First, it means calling the US Capitol switchboard at 202-224-3121. You can save that in your contacts. I hope that you will be using it often throughout your uh, careers and urge your senators to do everything within their power to pass comprehensive legislation like the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to protect our democracy. Second, it means getting involved in local elections, not only as voters, but potentially as candidates too. Our school boards, our library boards, our sheriff's offices, our prosecutor's offices are all spaces in which you can advance and more expansive view of democracy and justice. One of the best investments you can make in our democracy may be to invest your leadership in it. Most importantly, no matter how you participate, we need you to push yourselves and the rest of us to heed Thurgood Marshall's prescient and enduring decree. Where you see wrong or inequality or injustice speak out because this is your country. This is your democracy, make it protect it, pass it on. In other words, we all have a responsibility to shape and sustain our democracy for future generations. Where you see attempts to reduce access to the ballot, be it through racial gerrymanders, felon disfranchisement, or the kind of catch-all anti-voting legislation that was recently passed in Georgia, Texas, and Florida, speak out because this is your country where you see organized attempts to intimidate and threaten educators and school board members who want nothing more than to teach today's students and tomorrow's leaders the truth about our country's history. Speak out because this is your democracy. And where you see attempts by the state to encourage the kind of people who would respond to a peaceful protest or active civil disobedience by hitting the gas and using a car as a weapon of terror, speak out because we have a collective obligation to make, protect, and pass on the ideals that anchor our freedoms. But I'm not only asking you to lead us out of the fire, those of us who are not at the beginning of our careers, those of us who already bear scars from the victories and defeats of this time in our democracy's history, we still have work to do. We on the front lines also need you to override the cynicism and detachment that comes with age and believe that building an inclusive, multiracial and multi-ethnic democracy in this country is worth championing and it is possible. We need you to believe that achieving a country where young people have a direct say in their future, where every taxpayer, regardless of whether or not they're documented, can make their voices heard by their local officials, where voting is encouraged rather, rather than restricted or criminalized, that moment is now. As Dr. King said, no time for complacency is this. Rather, it is a time for rigorous and positive action. That's the work that we're doing at the Legal Defense Fund through our campaigns to protect the right to vote and the efforts to expand access to the ballot, through our work to reimagine public safety, to reform our criminal legal system, to seek economic justice and achieve education equity and excellence. And 
It's the work that gives me renewed energy when I know that there are people like you and the speakers you invited to participate in today's symposium, convening and thinking about ways to safeguard the vote and ways to make and protect our democracy such that it is worthy of passing on to the next generation. Thank you and I look forward to your questions.